I'm happy you're here to interview us. I think it's really great for Australians to be open to the research that we have here in American Sign Language about the deaf brain. And so, uh, first of all, we just really appreciate it. Uh, I work with Dr. Emery and have for many years now doing fMRI research and language processing, lingu linguistic processing. And um, we've done research um, related with facial expressions. Um, and we have uh, found that, broadly speaking, across all people, that uh, people express emotional facial expressions and their brain uh, tends to be activated on the right hemisphere. And that's broadly speaking again. Um, is this going okay? Or is yeah, and we understand, don't we, that um, emotions emotional meaning is often conveyed in the right side of the brain, isn't it? But Well, it's involved during processing, emotional uh, facial expressions. So when you see another person expressing emotion, often it is activated in the right hemisphere. And also, um, a linguistic processing tends to be in the left hemisphere, as we know. And so the interesting conundrum is for deaf people. People who uh, observe facial expressions that have a linguistic meaning, a grammatical meaning. And let me give you an example if I can. Mm -hmm. I wish this could be That'd caught. That'd be great. I wish this could be caught visually, but um, the example is uh, of adverbials mm. and adverbial facial expressions. Um, if we can describe the facial expressions that you are doing, so we yeah. might do that a bit on the way. Okay, for example, I'm going to use a sign now for writing. Um, okay, to write. So you've actually got your hand out in front of you and you are in effect holding a pen and writing on your hand. Right. And um, so my facial expression is like this. So my tongue is slightly protruding between my lips. And now I'm pursing my lips and using the same verb to write. So the verb remains static, intact, but what's changing is the facial expression. And they have completely different meanings. Mm. One meaning is that it's an everyday activity, um, that it's a normal activity, the other one has a different meaning. And so it connotes these different meanings by the facial expressions. So this is a simple example of how facial uh, expressions are used in American Sign Language grammar. Mm. For deaf people to observe someone speaking, they have to be able to process that information, both linguistically and effectively. And so the question that I wanted to raise was, what happens within the brain structures? How do people process this type of information? And so uh, we did a neuroimaging study using fMRI uh, as our tool to observe uh, how people, when viewing a sentence, would react, what would be evoked in their brain. Mm. Generally, hearing people, when they're watching emotional facial expressions, do have right hemispheric uh, stimulation as we would anticipate. Deaf people, however, have activity on both hemispheres. And when uh, deaf people are looking at facial expressions that are coupled with a sign, they have strong activity in their left hemisphere. Whereas hearing people who are unfamiliar with sign language, sign naive people, maintain right hemispheric stimulation. And so... Um, so they, in a way, they are not, people who don't sign um, aren't seeing the language meaning, the linguistic meaning in facial expressions, but deaf people are seeing both. Exactly. Uh, for hearing people who uh, see linguistic facial expressions, really they don't have anything semantically to tie it to. Mm. Uh, it's just meaningless. Uh, it might just be tied to some imagined emotion or whatever. Uh, so they don't ha have that kind of processing in the left hemisphere. But when deaf people see it, they have a specific linguistic meaning that is strongly tied to that facial expression, and that's why processing shows up localized in the left hemisphere. Which indeed is the hemisphere so central to language. Exactly. exactly. What, what happens, though, if 
someone uh, is both expressing emotion in a facial expression, but also in that they also are giving some sort of subtle sign language facial expression, some linguistic meaning. How does the how do, what have you revealed um, about the brain distinguishing between those? Well, we're, we're needing more investigation about that very question, but it's fascinating to think that people can distinguish between them. And uh, what we're finding so far is related right now with the linguistic processing, the affective, emotional processing. But as far as a mixture, that's something that we plan to do future research on, how we can distinguish between these two facial expressions that are occurring. I also want to talk about uh, perception. There's another study uh, that we did uh, with deaf people who have had a stroke, and they show uh, damage on either the right or left hemisphere. And what we found is that if the damage is in the left hemisphere, they aren't able to express linguistic facial expressions. Uh, but their normal uh, expressive emotional facial expressions are intact. And so, uh, if there's something sad or some event, they can process that, but their linguistic facial expression is missing. So people who have any kind of assault to their right hemisphere, um, uh, if people who have had uh, right hemisphere damage, uh, signers, for example, their expression of language, um, linguistic facial expressions, it's fine. It's fine, right. But for their emotional facial expressions, it's different. So again, it's showing the distinction between these two types of processing in the right and left hemisphere. Um, also, um, you might be able to take them in and process them simultaneously as you're perceiving them. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because um, the human brain is so... Uh, attuned to reading facial expressions. Um, we are, I mean, there is a whole sort of an anatomy to interpreting facial expressions, isn't there? G give us some sense of that in relation to your own work. Well, uh, it may be applicable to what you were saying, but as we're studying facial expressions, um, we've already found that for signers, uh, compared with uh, other types of other types of uh, facial tests, be facial behaviors, uh, what we have found is that uh, there's one kind of test called the Benton facial test that has been used. And it shows that signers are vastly superior to uh, the hearing control groups. And we've wondered why they're so much better at this task. And so in a study, we looked at a test called the uh, gl Global uh, Mooney Facial Expression Test that uh, looks for global facial expressions or features. And on that test, deaf and hearing people were not different. But when you compare uh, local facial features, suddenly what you're finding is that deaf signers are superior compared with their hearing counterparts. The reason that we speculate that's the case is because local facial features are so important to linguistic processing of sign language. And so signers have to monitor and maintain these online as they're in conversation. And so these may not be critical for hearing people to observe these so local it's not features. To recognize the person. It's not critical. Sorry. Oh. I guess this is more a personal question. How did you come to be uh, working as both a scientist who is deaf, 
but also on on particularly focused on sign language. Is that how you started out in science? Well, it's a bit of a story, but uh, I started getting interested through my interest in art. And somehow, when I was studying at UCLA, I started to switch over to the scientific inquiry. And I got interested in the brain and how it functions. Often we take for granted what we see around us, how the brain processes, how we speak, how we communicate. Um, how we process information and express ourselves. It's amazing, really. And once I got started, I just uh, delved into it fully. Sign language is wonderful to study, and I feel I can contribute my experience personally by my personal perspective. Uh, what, uh, what people tend to take for granted, hearing and deaf people, it's different. But we can work collaboratively as a team and, and challenge the assumptions that we have in our work and our experiences. And often we might make wrong assumptions and we need to share other perspectives. So this is the scientific method and I enjoy that and have throughout my career. It's interesting though, isn't it, that uh, science prides itself on its objectivity and there's often a lot of debate about how much subjectivity scientists bring to their work and whether that either strengthens their science or compromises their science. I wonder how you think about that relationship. Well, I think the thing about science is, first of all, you have to be curious, right? Uh, you have to have some subjective experiences, and then that can be supported by data. So you have to have good experimental design, of course. You have to be able to analyze the results and support your observations, uh, but um, that's an ongoing process. And I think that subjectivity, as subjective experience, is important because it can guide your process in the end. Um, the results have to be based in data. Do you think the fact that you are a native signer brings something quite distinct to the science? Can you give some dimensions to what that would be? Well, I think one thing that I can say is that my experience uh, as a visual person, I can compare um, let me, well, let me give you an example. Growing up deaf, um, when I was a young boy, and I was deaf, I considered being deaf perfectly normal, whereas other people had a different perspective about me. And I thought, what do you mean? This is the way it is. As I grew and matured, I started to understand that people hold different meanings to this experience of being deaf, uh, most related to their particular experiences and perspectives of life. So that I feel I can, can contribute. Did you imagine that you would be a scientist? Never. <laughs> no, not a scientist. I thought I'd be an, an engineer. One thing that does come to mind, just in, in interviews that I've done over the years, um, let's just say, for example, Indigenous people um, have who become researchers have a kind of inner turmoil <laughs> or conflict, for example, about whether or not they've, they're kind of being anthropologists of their own experience, that, that, that somehow this is um, kind of politically incorrect in a way, that they're ob observing their own selves in, as an anthropologist might. Do you know what I mean? I certainly know what you mean. I understand perfectly. And I think that every person has experiences that they have to go through, deaf or indigenous people. Um, but I think that science, well, people learn science uh, and they learn the facts. And sometimes how to explain to people that political perspective. It has to be distinct or separate. We're trying to talk about the truth and uh, about understanding more about ourselves. That's the foundation of it.